So this is a quick-ish recap of topic eight, which is energy forces doing work. Um, there are two energy topics in the edX style GCSE. One is in paper one, that's topic three, which is the conservation of energy, and one is in paper two, which is topic eight. There is a lot of crossover between the two topics. Um, what I've done is I have cut the bit of the topic three video that's relevant, and I'm gonna tag that onto the end of this video. Uh, so it's not gonna be in an amazing order, but I can't be bothered doing another 15 minutes of the same chat that I've just done. So um, the different things in topic eight that aren't in topic three are work done and power, whereas in topic three that isn't in topic eight is energy sources um, and trends in energy use. So it's just a little kind of bit at the end of each one. But we're gonna start with work done. Now work done is equal to energy transferred. Whenever energy is transferred, work is done. And that's because energy is simply the ability to do work. If these two things equal each other, they must have the same unit. So work done has the same unit of energy transfer, which is the joule. But there is an equation for work done, and that equation is simple, but has a caveat. So work done equals force times distance. However, the distance is quite special. It's the force times the distance in the direction or parallel, I should is better way to say parallel to the force. And the easiest way to explain that is with an example. So here I've got a box that I'm gonna push up a slope. There are two forces at play here. There are, I'll try and do them different colors to make them more obvious, weight. Now weight equals mass times gravity. So here the weight equals two times 10, which is 20 newtons. Um, and there's also friction. Now friction will act this way, but for you to manage to get the box up the slope, you have to push against friction. So you're pushing forwards. So we can think about two different types of work here. The work done against the weight or against gravity equals the force of weight, I'm gonna write weight, times the distance parallel to weight. So the weight is 20 newtons. Now the distance the box travels parallel to the weight, which acts downwards, it's the distance that it travels in the vertical plane. And this box, when it gets to the top of the slope, will have traveled three meters vertically. So the work done against weight is gonna be 20 times three, which is 60 joules. The work done against friction is going to equal the force of friction times the distance parallel to the frictional force. Now the force to push against friction is equal to 10 newtons and the distance that's parallel to friction, now friction always acts along the surface, so it will travel five meters along the surface, so it would be five times 10, which is 50 joules. So in total, you'd have to do 60 plus 50, 110 joules of work to push the box up the slope, but it's split up into two parts. So whenever you get a question about work done, just check that your distance is in the direction of the force. And the other quantity to know about is power. Um, now power is a really, really big part of physics. And the definition of power is the rate of energy transfer. Now, or work done. Because of the same thing, remember energy transfer equals work done. Now rate of means per second. So the equation for power is energy transferred per second, which is divided by time. And we write that as E over T, or you might see it written as W over T, and the symbol for power is the P. Um, the reason for W over T is because we can also say work done over time. So generally they are interchangeable. Um, the unit of power is the watt. And this gives my favorite self-answering question in physics, what is the unit of power? What is the unit of power? So the watt is the unit of power and it is equivalent, one watt is equal to one joule per second, one divided by there. Um, now, a quick kind of add-on is that a 
you will find out or you'll remember that efficiency is useful energy out over total energy in times by 100. Um, you can actually also use power instead of this. So you could write useful power out over total power in. Because power is energy over time, the energies will cancel. So you can use that in as equation just as a little caveat. So I'm now going to add in the bit of the video that is um, for the the kind of this crossover between dope both topics and um, so it might be a little bit out of order compared to what you'd expect um, but if you've already watched that you can stop watching the video now if you haven't already watched that you might want to recap those it does have quite an abrupt ending because i've just cut it off halfway through so hopefully it will be useful and blame edxl for splitting their topic up in such a weird way across two papers thank you on stuff so firstly what is energy well energy is the ability to do work or the ability to do something. If you haven't got energy, you can't do anything. And it's measured in joules with the symbol J. Now a really important um, principle that we must know about to be able to talk about energy is the conservation of energy, the principle of the conservation of energy. And you've probably heard this before, it's quite famous. It says that energy cannot be created or destroyed only transferred from one form to another. So the amount of energy in the universe was fixed at the moment of the Big Bang. We've not got any more or any, any less than we did then. Uh, it just keeps changing form. It keeps changing stores because it's transferred continually. So this word form, probably nowadays at the GCSE, we would say store. Um, it's, a, it's not a new thing, it's just a new way of, well, a uh, more recent way of thinking about energy. Energy has stores and transfers. Um, at Key Stage 3, you could have all just talked about types of energy, but now you're going to think about which types are stores and which types are transfers. So energy stores are when energy can be held in that um, form. Uh, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight main ones to know about. Uh, the famous ones are GPE and KE. Now, GPE is gravitational potential energy, I'm sorry either, um, anything with a height will have GPE, so if you'd lift something up, it has gravitational potential energy, it can fall, and KE is kinetic energy, and kinetic means moving, so anything that's moving has kinetic energy. There's also in, this, um, in the ones with these initials, EPE, which is elastic potential energy. And you look at that in more detail in a later topic. Um, but if you stretch or compress anything, um, so when you let it go, it can spring back to its original shape. It has elastic potential energy. Then we have thermal energy. Hot things store thermal energy. Uh, we have chemical and nuclear energy. So if you think about chemistry, when you put two chemicals together, there's a reaction. Some energy is often released. That energy was stored as in the chemical bonds of the um, elements or the compounds that you're using. Uh, nuclear energy is looking inside the nucleus of the atom. So chemical energy is about the electrons and how they're bonded to the atom, whereas nuclear energy is all about how inside the nucleus the protons and neutrons are bonded together. And then finally, we have electrostatic and magnetic energy stores. So think about if you've got a magnet, um, it can stick to another magnet. Um, when you pull it apart, it takes effort, so it takes energy, so it has some energy, it had some energy before. So they're the stores that you need to know about. There are then transfers, and the transfers are a little bit trickier to kind of get your head around. Now, the most obvious ones are light, sound, heat, and electricity. So energy cannot be stored in these forms. You can't store light. You can't put light in a box and keep it there. Um, it can transfer as that and then store as something else. Same with sound, heat and electricity. Um, light is often also known as biradiation. Um, and you could also use that for heat because heat is infrared, um, which is just a different form of light. Um, sometimes people use it for sound because they're saying it's by waves, but also sometimes people say that sound is mechanically. Um, and mechanically is the, the kind of the fifth way. I'm gonna give it another name, that's by forces. So if, 
if the energy is not transferred by any of these easier ones, like sand, heat, electricity, it's probably transferred by forces, and that's when something is moving. Uh, so if I push a box, I'm transferring energy by forces because I'm pushing it and pushing and working against friction. So you can any situation where energy is transferred, we can represent it in an energy transfer diagram. And here is a very, very simple one. Now, the way that they're often drawn for this exam is you have a box or a starting point, and the starting point and the end point, which is also a box, has to be a store. So energy cannot be stored as a transfer, so it has to be a store at the start and the end. And then along the arrow, you have your transfer. This is a very simple one where I'm starting with one energy, transferring by one type and then storing as another type but in real life they're much, much more complex than this. But a really common example is dropping a ball from a height. So if you've got a ball at a height, maybe you've picked it up, it will have GPE. So you'll start with the ball having GPE. At the end, as it falls, just before it hits the ground, it's going very fast, it's got a lot of speed, it's now moving. That GPE has been transferred to kinetic energy. And it's not been transferred by light, sound, heat or electricity, so it must have been transferred by forces because it's moving. Um, that's the simple one. If you were thinking about in real life and you're dropping a ball through air, um, the air in the ball would slightly heat up as it fell because of air resistance. So you could also add in there Ke plus some thermal energy of the surroundings um, and you could add in by forces and heat here. Um, heat and thermal, important distinction between them. Heat is when you transfer the source and the energy, sorry, and thermal is when you store it. So that brings us on to two main types of energy that we need to know some equations for, and that is GPE and Ke, which is why I've gone for those two in that last example. So I said before that GPE is given to any object that has a height where it's above ground level, and the equation for GPE is this, delta GPE, now delta means change in, it's a Greek letter, so change in GPE equals mg delta h equals mass, times gravitational field strength, times the change in height. And you'll often see this written without the deltas in there, without the triangles. Um, gravitational field strength is also known as acceleration due to gravity, and you know that it is 10 meters per second squared. Hopefully you can see that just about. Um, and also mg as an equation is a thing, um, and that equals weight. So you'll sometimes see GP written as GP equals weight, time change in height. Kinetic energy. Um, has a symbol Ke, the moving object. So if it's moving, it needs to have speed in the equation. And it's quite a tricky equation here. It is one half mv squared. So one half times mass times velocity, the speed squared. Um, to be fair, this is speed because it's a scalar. Um, people often forget to square and also often forget to half. And this is one of the trickier equations in the GCSE, so it's often kind of brought out in terms of rearranging for harder topics. So if you wanted to rearrange this equation in terms of velocity, it would be as follows. Firstly, I need to move that 2 that's on the bottom to the other side, so I get 2Ke. I need to move the m down here, v equals v squared, and then I square root that side. So this is the rearrangement that's quite tricky to do. Now, GP and Ke, if we think about the last example, I dropped a ball from a height and the GPE turned into Ke, it transferred to Ke. So what often happens is you'll have to work this out in a sum. And if we think about the conservation of energy, energy can't be created or destroyed, just transferred, we can say that GPE lost equals Ke gained. This is in a perfect world where we ignore things like air resistance. Or in the opposite direction, so if I throw a ball up in the air, I might be able to say it the other way around, I could say that GPE gained equals Ke lost. Um, and in that case, I can equate these two equations. I can say that MGH equals one half MV squared. And the useful thing about this is that I can cancel out one of the terms. I can cancel out M because it's on both sides. So to work out how fast something is going when you drop it, you don't actually need to know the mass of the object, you just need to know how high it traveled from. So let's say I wanted to work out how fast my ball was when I dropped it, um, at the end of the fall, I should say. I could write this as 2GH equals V squared, or I can square root V to get 2GH. And that is also quite commonly done, especially for more tricky questions at the end of the paper. Um, a final equation to know about for this topic is efficiency. And efficiency has 
a main way of um, working it out, and that is this. Efficiency is the useful energy transferred by an object divided by the total energy in. And then we can, if we want to, optionally times by 100 to make a percentage. Um, you can write efficiency as a percentage or as a decimal or even as a fraction. Um, for example, let's say I've got a light bulb. I'm really good at drawing light bulbs. And the light bulb uses 100 joules per second, but it only gives out light at a rate of 60 joules per second. The efficiency would be the energy that's usually transferred, which is light, uh, and that would be 60, divided by the total energy, which would be 100 times 100, and the efficiency is 60%. The other 40 joules have been wasted, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, they'd probably be here wasted as heat. Um, now we can put that into a diagrammatic form here with something called a Sankey diagram. So this is a Sankey diagram. And a Sankey diagram tries to show this, but in a diagram. And we start with the energy in on one side, and then we have the energy out. And convention states that the one at the top is usually the useful energy out. And then the arrow that starts to go downwards usually is the wasted energy. Now, it's not perfect here, but this arrow should be the same width the whole way through. So the total width here should equal the width here plus there. So if I call this, let's say, 1 and this 2 and this 3, 1 should equal 2 plus 3 because energy can't be created or destroyed, we can't lose it, it has to just transfer. Um, so it's easiest to draw this on squared paper to help you. Um, you don't have to have two arrows, you can have lots more arrows than that. Uh, you could have lots of different types of waste energy and in real life Sankey diagrams are pretty complex. Uh, but usually in the exam there's only two or three arrows. For this example I would label this with electricity, because that's energy that's going in, and then I'd label the useful as light and then the wasted which will be heat as so, and it's about the right size for that. Which brings me on to this idea here that efficiency is always less than 100%. So in real life, or IRL, I'm going to be down with the kids, in real life efficiency is always less than 100%. You do not get 100% efficient um, systems. Um, and that's because energy is always dissipated. I'm going to try and spell this correctly. Dissipated. Now dissipated means spread out to surroundings and it's usually as heat which then becomes the thermal energy of the surroundings and um, it can be not heat like if you want something to be hot then something else would be the energy that you wasted maybe it's sound or light if for example you know you're heating something up uh, with a fire uh, the light energy isn't needed it's a bit of waste um, but usually that dissipated energy will be heat. And the word dissipated is a really useful one to know for the exam. Now we need to know how we can reduce these energy losses um, to try and make um, the efficiency as close to 100% as possible. And these are just things to learn. If you've got a mechanical system that's with moving parts to reduce energy losses, you lubricate to reduce friction. Because when you reduce friction, you reduce the work done against the friction and you reduce how much heat is being lost to it. Um, so lubricating to reduce friction will reduce energy losses for mechanical systems. Um, for electrical systems, we use low resistance wires. So less energy is lost as heat. This is something you'll look at in more detail when it comes to electricity.